I'm uh, Todd Lowe, so I'm an associate professor in aerospace and ocean engineering, and I'm also the, the co-director of the Advanced Propulsion and Power Lab. And so it's a real pleasure uh, to, to get to speak to those who've taken the time to uh, check out our open house, and I, I look forward to an open discussion. I'm, I'm here also with, with Abby Caslin, who is a um, student in aerospace and ocean engineering, and, and so, so one of the students in the program that, that I'm involved with. And uh, she'll be, be, uh, uh, be helping to facilitate some of the questions and serving as as as, as the the, uh, the 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 enabler for uh, the the discussion here. So um, I'm just I've got a few charts that I thought I would share to try to ground everyone with what we are in terms of propulsion research at Virginia Tech. Very very basics in terms of what is propulsion and why do we even care about it? Why is Virginia Tech involved with it and the College of Engineering? and uh, just kind of dig into some of that. I want to acknowledge a couple other folks though, who are leadership of the laboratory. So co-director along with me is Professor Wing Ng. Uh, so Professor Ng is the craft professor of mechanical engineering. Uh, and then we also have a full-time laboratory manager uh, who keeps the place running, coordinates uh, lots of folks who use the lab, which is particularly important during the times of COVID and uh, it is really instrumental to making the place work. So I thought it good maybe to say just who we are before I say what we, what we do and, and, and uh, the, the, the types of stuff that we do. So we're a group, uh, it's quite a large group as a matter of fact, there's, there's anywhere from uh, 30 to 50 or 60 students involved at any given time. There are seven faculty members, meaning professors in aerospace and ocean engineering, mechanical engineering, who are involved all the time. Um, and there are five actually full-time professional research staff. And these include folks who are scientists who are working full-time at the lab, uh, engineers, uh, machinists who, who makes instruments and models, and an, in, an, 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 an engine mechanic who keeps some of the propulsion engines running for us. And then I think it's really important to, to note this. The story of propulsion at Virginia Tech ranges a very long time. So we have alumni who studied here and worked in uh, not this laboratory that you see on the screen here, but also but, but, but worked in another one I'll be highlighting uh, that's over the airport. Uh, that spanned uh, well over 40 years. And if you really look at the time span of, of, of the alumni who've been involved, it's, it's some 50 years of research that, that, is, that have gone on. Uh, so, so perhaps I'll make just one quick public service sort of note. There's a couple of pictures that I'll have in the presentation that show folks that aren't social distancing and aren't, aren't taking appropriate measures in the times of a pandemic. And those pictures were taken prior to, uh, to, to, to February 2020. So let's talk a little bit uh, to try to understand what, what our purpose is or what we're trying to do, and that's with propulsion and power. So that's, that's a simple problem, right? So I'll, I'll show how simple it is. Uh, it's, it's possible to distill this, this system, a propulsion system, down to in the case of an air breathing propulsion engine or power engine, gas turbine power engine, you've got air that gets pulled into an engine. You have energy that gets delivered to the, to the engine. And that energy can take a couple of forms. It can be chemical energy uh, in a fuel, or it could be electricity. So, so we're, we're moving more and more into electrically powered propulsion as a real topic. Then some magic happens in a black box, right? So we've got some sort of mechanical conversion. So taking an electrical uh, energy or chemical energy and doing something with it in order to generate thrust uh, or power. And so, so for, for the thrust piece, that would be making kinetic energy. So turning one form of energy into another. Uh, and uh, so kinetic energy would produce thrust or you can use it to, to produce power. So in the case of the ground-based gas turbine, you might be using natural gas to turn a turbine that then turns a generator. So now turning it back into uh, to electrical power. And really the, the business of propulsion and power is energy conversion. That's really the, the story of what we do. So it's simple. 
but is it really? So it, so it seems conceptually, I, I, I hope this, this resonates and it seems pretty simple. Uh, but then you, you look at kind of what's going on here and there's a lot of aerodynamics. There's a lot of thermodynamics. And those are two things that I teach. There's chemistry of combustion. There's a lot of materials problems because most propulsion engines are very, very hot. There's electromagnetics. I mentioned uh, mentioned the possibility of, of doing uh, having electric power. So you might have uh, a, 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 an engine that is that is is working off uh, of electricity and magnetism. And there's much more as you can only imagine. So here's the black box version of it. What does it look like in practice? I think you guys know the outside of the jet engine or a turbofan engine or, or any any type of propulsion. But what's going on on the inside and how does this relate back to, to what I was just describing? So shown here is an example of a turbofan engine. So as its name indicates, it is a turbine-based engine. All right, the turbine is the part that uh, is, is generating power from, let's say, chemical energy or chemical enthalpy. But then it's, it's doing a couple of things. So one is that it's taking that power and it's using it to drive a big fan. All right. And, and then second off, it's expanding the air out and accelerating it into a jet. So both of those things will end up producing thrust or producing power of flight. Um, and perhaps now you, you can sort of see how that previous chart links in. So you've got air that comes into the engine. It goes through a couple of different paths. We've got energy that flows through in the case of, of the gas turbine engines that most of us use now. This is gonna be something pretty similar to diesel fuel. I'm, I'm sorry, to kerosene, forgive me. For, it'd be similar to kerosene that uh, is flowed in there and produces, is, is uh, converted to mechanical engineering or to mechanical energy via combustion. And then you have these series of turbines that will extract energy out of the flow and either use them to compress the air or to accelerate the air and produce kinetic energy for the fan. But it turns out turbofans, I highlight them because they're the most common means that uh, in air travel that we choose to use uh, jet engines because they're very efficient in that they produce the most, the most amount of thrust per unit kinetic energy. So we want to optimize lots of times thrust and you don't actually want to have kinetic energy because that just flows down into the air and we don't get to use it. So it's really a game of how do you convert this energy, but then how do you use it to something that you actually desire, which in this case, we want thrust. We don't even want energy so much. And so uh, it turns out the optimization is, is very interesting. So now in terms of the lab, sort of what do we do and what's our mission? And I, I like to think of it as, the, the big role for those of us doing energy conversion is we'd like to have clean and accessible both transportation and energy. So we start thinking about the future of, of flight and, 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 and ultimate mi mission of what we're doing at Virginia Tech is trying to drive innovation. So you see uh, in, in the upper quadrant there is uh, an aircraft concept that was developed by colleagues at NASA, NASA Langley, which is in Virginia also. Um, it's a concept called the Stark ABL. So um, this concept has an engine, you may be able to see the inlet of it, mounted right at the rear of this aircraft. And it's thought that this concept may be the, the closest technology that we could start transitioning to more and more advanced technologies that will use propulsion in smarter ways. So this one takes uh, a, a viscous vertical flow, of a highly turbulent flow, takes and then puts it through the engine and essentially erases the wake of the fuselage of the aircraft. And so where does Virginia Tech fit in there? We are working with NASA in order to simulate what that airflow is on the fuselage so that they can understand the way propulsion is going to actually react to uh, this desire that's at the system level. So there's lots of examples like that where Virginia Tech plays an important role. Um, that's really driving the work that we do. But if I think about myself as, as an educator, I believe the most important thing I do is, is down here in the bottom left, which is research education. So here's an example of uh, three PhD students. Uh, two of them already have their PhD now. So Ashley Saltzman's on the far left. 
and uh, Kyle Daniels at the far right. So they both already have their doctorates and Matthew Boyd is shown in the center. He's about to get his and they're working on laser diagnostics that were intended uh, or that, that are intended to help us understand the noise of exhaust flows. So like that jet exhaust, how do we reduce that? So if you're near an airport, things are quieter. And so that's work that, that goes on in the laboratory. And the other thing that we do is testing. And so that uh, involves lots of different aspects. We have actual jet engines, we have rigs, we want basically hot, high temperature, high pressure air that uh, generates good test conditions that then folks can use or we can use to test out ideas and to see if instrumentation or hardware can survive these uh, sorts of conditions. So to do this, we've got to have lots of partners. So I thought it would be good just for me to, to have this up and for you to see some examples of the partners that we have. So we do a lot of work with NASA and the Navy and the Air Force in particular. So all of those are obviously government labs. Uh, in terms of the Navy, there's a couple of, of organizations that we're involved with. One is the, it was NAVAIR at Patuxent River. Uh, and then we also work with the Office of Naval Research. Uh, in terms of the gas turbine industry, we have two special uh, centers at Virginia Tech. One is the Pratt & Whitney Center of Excellence. So Pratt & Whitney is a, a company that, 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 that makes uh, gas turbine engines for military and commercial applications. And the same can be said for another company that we have, what's called a University Technology Center. Uh, and that's Rolls-Royce. And it's important to point out, this is not the Rolls-Royce that makes cars. They started with the same uh, the, the same seed company, but many years ago they split off. So this company uh, makes heavy industries and especially uh, propulsion and energy uh, gas turbine engines. The other thing I thought interesting to point out is that we do a lot of work with companies in the New River Valley. So I listed four that I know that we have some active things going on right now. Uh, so, so Nanasonic is a materials company. Texburg is a uh, aerothermodynamics, gas turbines, and manufacturing company. Prime Photonics and Luna Innovations are both instrumentation and fiber optics companies. Uh, and, and all of these uh, folks have been to the lab and uh, have assisted in, in, uh, in performing testing with us or do projects that are active with us as well. So if you'd like to come by and see us or even just, just drive by and, and see the lab, here's where we are in Blacksburg. So campus is, is generally north from, from this map. You can see 460 going there. If you're driving westbound, uh, then, then, then it would be going kind of in the direction of my mouse here. So we have one lab I'll highlight. It's at the Corporate Research Center. We have another lab that's a bit of a secret and you might not even know about it, but it's on airport property. Uh, and it's, it's just off uh the the, the 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 research center drive just past the airport terminal and that's where we actually run some of our jet engines and so uh there's some really interesting work that goes on both sides i like putting this chart up just to show you that we have a lot of stuff so it's too bad that i can't see you in person and we can actually go and touch some of this stuff but um we have two sites as i've already mentioned we generally operate the gas turbine engines at the airport site. This is a really interesting uh, place where we've got uh, these gas turbine engines in a very old building. So it looks not impressive. The capability is extremely impressive. Some of the, the best capabilities of any university in the US and perhaps the world for doing full scale gas turbine engine work. And um, the story on this lab was, I can just give you the, 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 the highlight, is it was an old World War II training facility for engine mechanics. And so in the war effort, the government needed more and more mechanics. We had lots of aircraft. And so this was set up to uh, allow folks to train and then also test the engines. And so then when, when uh, Professor Walter O'Brien, who is, is really the founder of this lab, uh, found it back in the 1970s, he realized exactly what it was. It was this turbine engine uh, or, or aircraft engine test capability. And uh, it was possible then to, to begin this process. And I'm really proud to say that, 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 that even after uh, 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 Professor, uh, Professor O'Brien has stepped down from his leadership of this, uh, this lab, we've continued to develop it and we have even more capability today than we did even 10 years ago. 
The other sites at the Corporate Research Center, I can't talk about all of these different rigs. If anybody has a specific question about a certain type of rig, if you if you know much about the sort of conditions, like maybe maybe what's the hottest rig that we have, I think I've got some other charts that, that I can dig into and, and I can provide some of that information. One thing that does, doesn't come up later is that outside of this lab, you have to have a power plant. So you have to deliver air. In this case, we've got two very nice compressors that can give us three pounds of air per second at 175 PSI. And then we store the air and then sometimes we blow it down and sometimes we, we run continuously. So we have rigs that do everything from simulating a, uh, a an air breathing, but solid propulsion uh, uh, style of engine that's very close to a rocket. It's called a ramjet. We have a hypersonic wind tunnel that can go to Mach 7. We have a shock tube that goes to Mach 4. And we have some rigs that get very high temperature. Um, so, for instance, this combustion rig that's depicted here can go up to about 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit of gas temperature. And, so, and uh, perhaps I'll point out one more thing. We have this, uh, this free jet rig that simulates exhaust flows. It goes up to about 700 degrees Fahrenheit and can produce Mach 2 flow. We had a quick question, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Lowe. Yeah. Um, someone asked, can you participate in research at this lab being a mechanical engineering major? Or, you know, I'm going to also take that into someone who is not involved in the aerospace department. Absolutely. And, and I, I should have made it clear, this is a college level laboratory. So I'm an aerospace and ocean engineering professor, but my, my friend, uh, uh, professor Wing Ying is the co-director. He's a mechanical engineering professor. So uh, if you look at the number of professors involved, I think we have three in aerospace and four in mechanical engineering. So th there is absolutely an opportunity to get involved. And so um, definitely please be in touch and, and, and let me know if I can make any connections for that. That's a great question. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the couple of the, the uh, sites that we have. So <clears throat> I've already mentioned this airport site, and so I've just got a couple of, of mentions by the numbers. So we've operated this lab for more than 40 years. The, 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 the lab in the time that it's been used for research is actually it has been going on uh, uh, prior to, to, to the time I was even born. So uh, it's a real legacy and a real history of doing this kind of research at Virginia Tech. And it's really rewarding. I'll go to conferences, let's say, and I'll see alumni who I, I have no clue who they are. They've graduated 30 years ago even. And they, 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 they remember fondly, let's say, their time working with Dr. Ng or working with Dr. O'Brien especially and ask is the Turbo Lab, that's the legacy name of this lab, is the Turbo Lab still doing well, is it there? So uh, that's really exciting. We have four gas turbine engines and they're shown there. One of them is a Pratt & Whitney Canada turbofan engine, bottom left. Another is a Honeywell TFE 731 turbofan engine. This is our biggest engine. It produces about 4,000 pounds of thrust. We have a Pratt & Whitney Canada PT6 turbo shaft engine. Okay, so, so, so this is an engine uh, that's actually run on a dynamometer and we measure the power. So these others produce thrust. This one produces shaft power. And our newest engine is a Rolls-Royce Model 250 turboshaft engine. Both of these engines that I showed there produce about 500 horsepower. And then we have to dissipate that energy using water in what's called a water brake dynamometer. And so each of these engines have been run within the past few months. We have active research projects on, I think, all of them right now. And uh, they're, they're really a great asset that's extremely unusual. I don't know of other universities that have this kind of stable of engines, as we like to call them. And I also know that there's uh, some 70 undergraduate visitors that come as part of, of the courses that I teach in propulsion, for instance. And I'm sure I'm missing some others, too, that we'll, we'll visit on, on other uh, for other reasons, certainly open house being one of them. All right, so I'd like to show a little video that we have here running the Model 250 engine. And uh, it may turn out to be loud. I'm going to try to reduce the volume. So, so if you want to be um, careful on your speakers, I, uh, the main thing that you can get out of this, this video is the sound of the engine. Um, because engine test is a little bit boring when it's actually going on. But the sounds and the vibrations are the exciting part. 
I, I will ask you maybe have your attention <clears throat> in the area that I'm highlighting right here. Uh, when the engine actually starts up, you'll be able to see this little flame ball that shoots out. So what, what, what that signifies is whenever we are transitioning from the starter, which is electrical, to the engine running itself. So we turn on the fuel at that point. And, you know, there's a transient time. There's a time where you, you basically get a little small explosion and it's blowing out fuel that was unburned. And then it eventually combusts and it burns in, in the exhaust nozzle. So I'll start it and see if this runs and see if you get the audio. I'm going to reduce it so it doesn't blow you guys out. So this was an idle run that we, as you can see, we ran it back in September last fall. And I think the audio will come through. If it doesn't, I've got the YouTube link that, that you can uh, click on later. So there you, you, you could just see the flame ball shoot out there. Thanks, Abby. Perfect. And then the other interesting thing that you can hear at the end is that the engine stops quite quickly as well. Let's see. There we go. I can get the uh, animations to work. There, there we go. Yeah, so, 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 so the engine gets going fairly quickly in that one. And, and really the goal of, of that was we, we were, we were um, trying to document just a really quick run. And so it was very condensed. We would typically run that engine anywhere from a half an hour to two hours uh, at, at a time. And once you turn off the fuel, you could tell the engine just, just ramps down. And normally in the time that you heard it being a constant noise, that's whenever we would be getting whatever data is needed for that test. So here's our other site. And we're really blessed to have a couple of sites to do this research. This is the one, uh, that's more commonly called APPL, Advanced Propulsion and Power Lab, but uh, I, I oftentimes refer to it as the CRC site of, of one unified lab. So we opened this for research back in 2014, so pretty new lab, and really we didn't get going on serious research there until about 2015 or 2016. Uh, now it's quite active. We've got each room uh, of the 8,100 8, square feet that you see there is filled up. There's rigs in every room. A uh, feature of it is that we have control rooms that are adjacent to rigs. You can see control rooms there, control room there. And then we have a nice yard out here where those compressors was that I, the compressors were that I was talking about. A uh, couple other interesting facts is that uh, in, in AOE anyway, and I, I apologize for the uh, the, 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 the person who was asking about mechanical engineering. So, so we, we hope to have some mechanical engineering labs in the future. As of right now, we do run AOE labs in, in this facility and we'll have about 200, uh, 200 undergraduates who uh, make use either through lab class or through undergraduate research uh, of, using, uh, of using this lab each year. So, so certainly, uh, uh, for those doing undergraduate research, those are our students in, in mechanical and aerospace and ocean engineering. The other thing cool about this lab is that this crazy looking chimney over here is an exhaust. It's an exhaust for a 7,000 pound thrust engine, up to that anyway, that we could accommodate in, in that engine test cell. So to this point, we don't have such an engine there. We uh, are, are in continual talks about trying to place one there, but in, in, the, in the near term, the plan is to take that uh, Model 250 engine that you just saw and locate it at, at the APPL because there's uh, some advantages to having the engine there for some of the support hardware and the modernization that we have in this building that we don't have in the other building. So it allows us actually to have a lot of fluidity between some of the rig testing that goes on and the things that, that happen on the engine. And really, uh, one of the messages I feel like that, that hasn't come across yet is Virginia Tech is positioned in a unique uh, place where we can do everything from very fundamental physics to fundamental engineering at low technology readiness levels, so basically discovery level, and then progress a discovery through the various steps that it takes to turn it into basically a product for a company like Rolls-Royce or Pratt & Whitney to be able to use and to help all of humanity by, by putting it on new, new engines and new hardware. And so this lab uh, really has that capability 
by having the engine and everything else that goes down in this uh, hierarchy of complexity. So the last thing I want to leave you with is one more video. And this is talking about the work I was I was just mentioning of how the rig can link, link to the engine and how the benefits are of us to have both of those under the same roof. And so rather than me describe it, I think I'll let the students involved uh, talk about it. So. We're basically doing research on sand ingestion within jet engines. What you have is all these planes flying around, especially in the Middle East, where there's a lot of sand in the air. And that sand gets into the plane engines, and that's not very good for the performance. I started off on a Rolls Royce project. I'm uh, funded by Rolls Royce. And so I uh, designed this rig with several components. Uh, the jet is already there, but we added a sand feeder, the particle analyzer, and this stage. And the goal is to eventually have particles colliding with metal coupons. And these coupons will be made out of typical jet engine materials. And we're going to look at the erosion of that. That's in the future. But we also decided to combine this project with a different project where we're interested in putting a probe inside of a jet engine to also look at erosion. Right now, we're in the very beginning stages of that research. This is a, a jet rig. It accelerates uh, air up to above Mach 1. And we're accelerating this air into a probe, and we're implementing sand upstream of the flow. So sand will be accelerated with this air. So a probe is really simple. It's basically a tube that bends 90 degrees, and it's made out of polycarbonate. You can position it head on into the flow, but we also want to test different angles. It has one end that sticks into the back end of our jet, and that end captures the sand. The other end will lead to our particle analyzer that will allow us to analyze the sand. We know how to digest the data. We know how to use the data the probe is giving us to make distinctions and come to conclusions on what the sand is doing inside the engine because there's no clear way to see inside of an engine. Great. So I think, uh, yeah, that's all the prepared materials that I had. I would be more than happy to answer further questions or show some more uh, parts that, that, that are in the lab. Uh, and I just really appreciate folks for taking the time to come and, and listen. Yeah, so we have um, one question for you. Um, Jack asks, do student organizations like Rocketry, Rocketry or the Orbital Launch Vehicle um, Design Team have access to the labs? And I know that um, the Wear Lab definitely is, is a big one for a lot of design teams, but um, I guess on a bigger scale, does your lab do any work with design teams? Um, so yes, and there's lots of, lots of little, uh, caveats and twists and turns there. So, um, we, 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 we were the site for Hyperloop at, at one time. So, so Hyperloop at VT. Um, we also were the site to allow, uh, rocketry at VT and, 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 and various other rocketry organizations, uh, to set up at one time. That uh, th that effort was shifted over uh, what about six uh, six or eight months ago, um, to, to uh, uh, once the new AEDL was was set up. Um, however, if uh, our rigs are helpful for these teams, then there are possibilities to be able to to get access and to be involved. So, for instance. Um, uh, what, what one good mechanism to get involved is uh, through through the college or through the department through uh, funds that are available. Let's say for design teams. Um, something else that, that that came out of this was um, we were involved uh, in, in AOE with redesigning our curriculum. We came up with a design laboratory. And so um, the, the opportunity can exist for design teams to, to actually use APPL if it's well planned um, in, in the, their design laboratory in the spring semester. Um, lastly, I will say that our machine shop is a good option for design teams to have things made. So if, um, uh, you know, if, if there's parts that, that, that need to be made, we have a, a very capable machinist. The only drawback is that it, it does cost the actual cost. So, so it's not possible for us to, to just say, yeah, we, we'll, we'll have it made for free. 
but the cost is extremely competitive. And I think most teams normally have, have a small budget anyway, and it, it doesn't cost that much to get some things made. I think I'll add one more thing. So, so something else did just pop into my mind is that I know uh, Dr. Meadows, a mechanical engineering professor, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, when, when Dr. O'Brien was with us as well, um, had a design team that built a natural gas-based combustor and gas turbine that we operated off of the air supply at APPL. So that was a great example where they built their own little rig and plugged it right into our air supply, got the engine to run, got the data they wanted and really achieved what they wanted to with their design team. The key is though, there's so much that's dangerous here. You have to really be integrated. You gotta make sure that one of the professors involved with APPL is among one of the advisors and overseers of what you're doing. Right, that makes sense. Um, while more attendees are thinking about what questions you know they want to ask you, um, I have a f few more to start off with. Great. Um, yeah. So that was more relating to students involved in design teams. Um, yep. On the other side, I know that undergraduate research is very popular, especially with these types of labs, which are so incredible. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, I know that before you were talking about the ability for students to really figure out the discovery and the research side of it, as well as um, the whole entire sort of overall product side of it as well with working like the, with those companies that you were talking about. Um, do you mind touching on a little bit about um, you know, how to get involved as an undergrad um, and you know, interested in your lab specifically? Absolutely. So, <clears throat> excuse me, please, please forgive me. The, the process right now is relatively organic. So the, the best thing I would advise you to do, um, go to the APPO website. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and pull up that website so, so I can show you all the faculty involved. So if you go to the APPO website, you'll see people. My internet's slow right now. And you'll come up with all these contact numbers or, or contact names. So um, it's always possible that a cold email may go unanswered at first. I, I, and that's just a fact of life for the professors. So please forgive us in advance for that. I would say be persistent. And if you're having trouble getting a hold of someone who is doing something that you like, go ahead and try to reach out to me. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll be responsive. Uh, just, 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 just feel free to, uh, to, to try to catch me. Um, the other thing I, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and share is there's at least one more formal opportunity that we're working on rolling out for the fall, and that's with Pratt & Whitney. So uh, I'm the director of the Pratt & Whitney Center of Excellence, where uh, we're coming up with a series of projects that are going to be long-lived that are not design projects. They're specifically made for uh, undergraduate researchers who may be able to contribute for a semester or who may want to come in as a sophomore, let's say, and contribute for three years. And so you can get a deeper and deeper uh, sort of exposure. And so uh, I, I, I'll, I'll say the details of that. Uh, I, I hope to roll it, roll it out before the end of the spring semester so that folks can go ahead and sign up and be vetted to get into that program for the fall. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that that's two ways. And if you're having trouble getting traction, I think if you contact me or contact the lab manager, I, I believe that, that we could um, uh, try to work with you to find a good spot. Awesome. That's very helpful. Then um, we had a question about, um, are there opportunities for field trips um, or to visit labs at, you know, research partner groups like NASA, Pratt & Whitney, and all those different companies that you have been mentioning? And, um you know, with COVID, how has that sort of had an effect on any of those visits? Yeah. Well, that's a really good question. And it's one I'm going to write down because it's, it's something I feel like we haven't done a great job at. Um, <clears throat> trying to think in terms of field trips, the, the closest thing I can remember to field trips uh, that are related to this is that uh, there used to be, I don't know if there still is, a, a a trip for the the AOE students. I think the AIAA students were organizing to go up to the Air Force Research Laboratory specifically to see the Air Force Museum that's up there. In terms of some of the other places that were mentioned, um, to be honest, I I, I think I'm going to have to take some homework on that because we normally do this on an as needed basis because each one of these, um, it's normally quite difficult for, for those companies to have a, a really pure open house uh, companies or, or, or labs. 
And so um, it's normally the case where I'll have to submit everything about myself to Pratt and Whitney a month ahead of time, and they'll check me and make sure I'm not on all kinds of lists. And then finally, they say I can come. So the logistics of that for some places are a little tough. What's interesting, though, is that a place like NASA Langley Research Center does have an open house quite a lot like this, and they allow the public to come. And so uh, what I get from that question is that maybe uh, there's a role for APPL to play to facilitate some of that for our core uh, uh, groups or, or our core places. I think it's a great question. So the answer immediately is, is no, I don't have a really formal way to do it. There's some informal ways that we can probably hook something up here and there. But I think it's a fantastic idea. And the last part of the question I want to get to, in the COVID times, um, the only place I've been since March, and I, I'm a guy that I, 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 I'd say that Abby can say this, is I, I traveled all the time prior to COVID. So I'd always be posting video lectures and things like that. Um, I have, I've traveled one time since March. I, I went to AFRL in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, so so here, here's something else funny. We were hosting NASA visitors last week in Blacksburg because they aren't allowed to go into their labs. So they came to use APPL, really fascinating. For a Mars lander mission, they have a wind tunnel test that they want to do. And they came uh, to test one very specific component of this so they can be ready for that test in July sort of time frame. And I'm really proud that our lab could play that kind of role. Uh, but that means there's no way I'm getting on it at NASA Langley right now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That was a good question. Um, good so one. relating specific to, you know, this lab, I know that we have some absolutely incredible labs here on campus and um, all over the place on campus. So it was very helpful for you to, for you to map everything out. But um, what is your favorite aspect about, you know, APPL specifically compared to everyone else? Compared to everyone else. So, I mean, I, I, I've got to go for the technology. I, I, I love aerothermodynamics. So we have the most capable lab on, 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 at, at, at the university for having hot, high pressure gases that we're willing to, 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 to blow around and produce high thrust jets, right? So it's, it's really the, the rubber meets the road or the, the, the fuel meets the combustion sort of work. So the fact that um, I can show up at the lab and we've got this amazing team, our professionals are amazing and our students as well, can be running a turbofan engine, you know, uh, uh, from the time they, they start the process to running, it's 15 to, to 30 minutes. And then two doors over from me, I can feel this turbine engine shaking everything. Uh, it, you know, you kind of think I'm doing some real aerospace engineering applications. So, so I think having those engines is really important and just having these really extreme conditions. There's nowhere else on campus that has, has that kind of capability. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then I had one last question. Um, sure. And again, attendees, you can kind of ask questions as 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 you as you kind of come up with them. Um, but looking towards the future, with you know some of these attendees maybe being in their senior year of high school or looking forward to Virginia Tech, um, interested in mechanical or AOE, um, what is something you're most excited about for the future for this lab, or you know, in regards to um, new projects, new technology coming in, um, anything related to that? Absolutely. Well, th there's general growth right now in, in the lab. That we, we've had a lot of new faculty come on. So I think I'll highlight um, two or three things that get me excited. Number one is we've got a, a big new initiative that the Navy's funding that's in partnership with Rolls-Royce. It's about $1.5 million over the next five years where we're using that Model 250 engine that I was just talking about in order to study just what Addison said, the effects of sand being ingested into engines. And this is really important for accessibility of propulsion. I was the Navy funding it, the Navy has real problems, but civilian aircraft have problems too because we're operating always in sandy environments. We always have volcanoes that like to erupt, right? This just happens, we can't control this. And we want to be able to, to, to to, to, to move around uh, even if there's ash in the air. So the, what's the accessibility aspect? Well, it's all about making transportation uh, less expensive. 
So right now, the biggest penalty we pay for these environmental effects, so dirty air and dust in the air, is that it makes the parts degrade more quickly. So if we're able to uh, make a real impact on understanding this problem and giving folks a way to avoid this problem, it will make transportation cheaper because our engines will last longer. We'll be able to know when we can fly and not fly and, and, and uh, take the right paths. The other thing that I think is really exciting about the lab is that we have some uh, new rigs that are coming online that are, that are super cool. I mentioned one of them is this, air, this uh, solid fuel ramjet. That's Professor Greg Young in AOE that's developing that one. So, 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 so that one's special because it's looking at pushing the horizons of high-speed flight. And Virginia Tech has an important role. We're members of the consortium uh, for, 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 for hypersonic vehicles. And so uh, we're going to have a role and a say in what it's going to take to even get humans to fly at Mach 7. I mean, that's way off in the future, but, but we're doing things that can, that can help that uh, to become a reality. And then last off, I'll mention Professor Joseph Meadows, is a mechanical engineering professor, is about to commission a brand new uh, rig that's going to be the first, world's ever first, first ever in the world afterburning engine simulator that's made to reduce jet noise of, of high-speed aircraft. And so we're going to have, you know, 3,000 degree Fahrenheit air shooting out of the back of the lab that simulates like an F-35 engine. And uh, that's going to allow us to actually do very fundamental research because the conditions have never been studied, um, but also uh, do it at these conditions that don't exist. So there's also a very strong application. Yeah, that's all very exciting. Um, we have one more question from Victor. Um, what kind of machining or manufacturing capabilities do you have? Yeah, great, great question. It's uh, the, the capabilities are very strong, but they're but they're not. Uh, they're, 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 there's not a breadth of them. So so we have a uh, a three axis CNC machine with with something like a. Uh, 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 20 inch bed, so something like that. Uh, so, so it's like a 20 by 20 inch part that uh, could be manufactured there. We have a hand mill, we have about a 12 inch lathe that is, is, is a manual lathe. Then we have welding capability. And then there's, there's a full time machinist. I'll, I'll definitely mention him. His name is Randall Monk, uh, who has some 30 years of experience in industry and at Virginia Tech as well. He even has experience in teaching laboratories for machining. So this is someone that's just an awesome person to have for the students and really helps you to do this transition between learning what you're doing and actually working with a machinist and a, and a real machine shop. So uh, the capabilities are, are sufficient. There's still some things we send out like certain high nickel metals that we like to use are very hard to machine. We just don't have the, enough power in our machines. Our machinist has the capability. Our machines can't do it. Awesome. Yeah, that's all very helpful. Um, one more question from Jack is, what is the coolest project that you are ever part of at the lab? At the lab, what was the coolest one? I mean, I like a lot of them. <laughs> Kind of like uh, 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 choosing your favorite child or something, right? <laughs> it's the classic cliche joke. Um, well, it's a cool question. I'm trying to think the the to be honest, the, the the one I was just talking about a few minutes ago, where, where we had NASA come, that one turned out to be very productive, and it was a short term project. It was very cool because what we were looking at were these very high Mach number supersonic uh, uh, propulsion engines that we connected up in the lab and we ran them on like 2000 PSI gas bottles. And the intent of those engines uh, w w will eventually be to simulate or to help them validate their designs for the next generation NASA lander that uh, it, 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 it is going to be using retro propulsion on Mars. And so, 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 so what Virginia Tech was doing there is helping them to make their instruments work. We generated a way for them to be able to see the flow with lasers by uh, 
coming up with a method that they could put particles into that jet flow. And so we looked at visualizing that flow. We did that with a shadow graph technique. We also measured the particles moving, did that with what's called particle image velocimetry. So we got the velocities of all of that. And now NASA has all this amazing data. They're going to go back and uh, validate that what we did uh, works quite well. And then now they're ready for their wind tunnel test. That's one example. Some others that I'm really super excited about, like the... Um, the, the 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 supersonic jet noise work that we, we've already done a lot of that and that's why we got the new work with the afterburner we uh, came up with a way to reduce supersonic jet noise using an afterburning engine by just turning off some of the fuel sprayers and it was it was a very unexpected result where if you have a cold section in the engine and it's surrounded by a hot section that actually changes the way the turbulence is made and you can reduce uh, jet noise by quite a bit. And that one's very visual. So for me, that was very exciting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, th I think j just the fact that, uh, that, that, that NASA trusts us enough that they'd call us up and, and uh, you know, use our technology, use our laboratory, and that's a success. That, that's, that's a recent story, but, but one that's very important. Yeah, that's all very exciting. Cool. Very, very interesting. Um, so yeah, I think that's all the questions from okay. the attendees right now. Um, thank you again for an awesome presentation um, on the APPL. Um, very, very informative. Um, great talking to you as always. And um, thank you to everyone for coming out. It's been really great talking to all of you and answering all your questions. Um, so yeah. Very good. <laughs> thank you so much, Abby. And thanks to all of those who attended. Really enjoyed it. And I hope all of you have a great rest of your week. Bye, everyone. Yeah.